Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Harrison, and on behalf of AARP, the magazine, I want to welcome you to this special live event. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan member organization that has been working to promote the health and well being of older Americans for more than 60 years. And while 60 years is a long time, today we're here to learn some life lessons from a person who has been in the public eye for even longer than that. Queen Elizabeth II. And while we all hope to age well, stay vibrant and vigorous throughout our lives, she demonstrates that every day. At the age of 94, she's the longest reigning monarch in British history and still puts in a 40-hour work week. In this month's AARP, the magazine, we share how the Queen spends her days with intent and commits to habits that improve the length and quality of her life. Today, we'll take that story off the pages of the magazine and have a conversation with all of you. Our guides for this discussion are people with knowledge and personal experience with Queen Elizabeth II. Now, if you've participated in one of AARP's live events, you know that you can ask questions live on the phone or you can add them to the comments section where you're watching. So if you're joining us on the phone and would like to ask a question, please press star three on your telephone to be connected with an AARP staff member who will note your name and your question and place you in a queue to ask that question live. And if you're watching on YouTube or AARP.org, you can post your questions in the comments section. So, hello again. If you're just joining us, I'm Barbara Harrison. On behalf of AARP, I want to welcome you to this discussion on the life lessons that we can all learn from the Queen. We're taking your questions live. If you're on the phone, please remember again to press star three to ask your question. And if you're watching online, you can place your question in the comments section. Later on, we're going to be joined by AARP Senior Vice President Jean Setsfan, who will help facilitate your calls today. This event is also being recorded, and you can access the recording at aarp.org slash ATM Presents 24 hours after we wrap up today. And now I am very excited to introduce our first special guest, Jane Seymour is a Golden Globe and Emmy-winning actress who many of us know as the star of Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, and of course her many memorable roles on the big screen, like the beautiful Bond girl in Live and Let Die. And I just watched her myself the other night in a rerun of the award-winning film East of Eden, and she was terrific. She's also appearing in two upcoming films, The War with Grandpa and Friendgiving. And very relevant to our conversation today, she's also the recipient of an Officer of the British Empire designation from Queen Elizabeth II. Welcome, Jane. Hi, nice to see you. Well, it's so great to have you with us. We're so happy that you're joining us today. And uh, as I just shared, among your many honors and awards for your continuing outstanding career, you're a recipient of the Officer of the British Empire designation from the Queen. Can you tell us what that signifies and what that means to you? Well, um, it, it's the biggest honor, really, apart from being a dame, which is with the next honor up. It's the order of the knighthood. Um, I was privileged, as you can see, I, I was actually given it by Queen Elizabeth II herself, which is not very often. She doesn't do them all anymore. And um, it was just an enormous honor. Um, I actually played Wallace Simpson. That's a picture of me with uh, Anthony Andrews when I played Wallace Simpson. And it occurred to me that having played Wallace, that of course, if Wallace had never happened and never met Edward, uh, Queen Elizabeth would never have been the queen because Edward would have been the king. And um, here it is. Here is the actual OBE. Wow, in the that box is that it comes in. Absolutely yes, beautiful. It, it's it's an incredible honor, and uh, I'm very proud to have received it. Do you get to wear it ever? Um, you do not really. Um, you can wear this little one that you also get, which you can wear more often. But the big one, you can only wear it at white tie and tails events, which, of course, don't happen very often in Malibu. Um, but Sir <laughs> Elton John used to put one on every year for charity at his home in England. And uh, we all kind of call the, the OBE or the knighthood a gong. I don't know why it's called <laughs> gong, but everyone's invited to wear their gong. So we all used to dress up and do that. Yeah, I was wondering about the big one, but the little one is beautiful. T 
to many, especially yeah. in America, monarchy can seem quaint and possibly dated. Of course, it's just one part of the United Kingdom system of government. There's a parliament and there's a prime minister, but the crown, after so many centuries, remains an integral and very important role in England. How does the queen maintain effective leadership over her seven decades on the throne? And do you think Americans understand the importance of her leadership, Jane? You know, it's very interesting. Chester has very fine lines. She cannot get involved in politics. However, she does meet the prime minister and she does hear about everything that is going on and she opens parliament and does all these official things, but she cannot be involved in po in politics at all. And, um, and it, you know, it's, uh, and she's also uh, the head of the church because when Henry VIII wanted a divorce, he um, got rid of the Pope and uh, decided to become the head of, uh, you know, the Church of England, which was basically like the Catholic Church, but done in English. So uh, it's a very complicated, long story of history. But um, I think that the royal family and the, that heritage, the, the whole royal customs, all of that is, um, is actually quite important to England. Quite apart from the fact that in terms of tourism, I think a lot of people come to England just to see all these things, to see these beautiful palaces, which are now open to the public, um, to see the crown jewels, to to see, you know, uh, these these uh, special events. But, you know, they do not rule the country. No, that that hasn't happened for a long time. Well, we have a lot more questions for you, Jane. We're going to get back to you in just a little bit. I want to remind folks who are watching or listening to uh, to us right now who might want to ask a question, please press star three if you're on the phone. And if you're watching, you can place a comment on the YouTube or AARP.org. Okay, we're going to get to uh, your live questions just in a little bit. But before that, I want to introduce you to our next guests who are both experts on the royal family. Diane Kahane is a New York Times best-selling author and the Royals editor for Best Life, which is an online magazine. And Brian Kozlowski is a lifestyle researcher and author of a new book called Long Live the Queen, 23 Rules for Living from Britain's Longest Reigning Monarch. So, Diane, let's start with you. Maybe you can tell us, how has Queen Elizabeth grown in the last uh, seven decades that she's been on the throne? What traits from her earliest days have faded, and what has she stood firm on? Well, I think that Queen Elizabeth has always prided herself on being in touch with the British people's feelings and thoughts. And all of that was very consistent up until one week in September in 1997. Princess Diana's death pretty much changed that for a very extraordinary week. And during that time, the Queen was sort of made to confront a lot of changes, seeing how the British people felt very emotional about that event, and more so just made her realize that she wanted to get closer to the people in order to modernize and be with them. And she gave that very moving address, telling people that as a grandmother, she was protecting William and Harry during that time. And after that, it was a bit of a turning point for her and for the monarchy. It became much more humanized and, and more accessible to people. And I think it shows that even at an advanced age, she was willing to change. That can be a very difficult thing for people later in life. And she is very smart about picking up on how things have to change and be modernized in order to sustain the monarchy. So that was really a brilliant thing that she did. And Diane, you have so many interesting stories to tell. I read one this morning. We'll talk about that later. We're going to get back to you in just a little bit, but I want to remind people who okay. uh, might be uh, wanting to join us, if they can, by phone or uh, over, the, uh, over the internet. Let's go to Brian now. Brian, I understand that you wrote the article about the Queen that is appearing in our month's, uh, this month's AARP, the magazine. So we'd love to hear your insights here. I also had a chance to take a look at your book, which we have right here with us right now. It's coming out in November, I believe. It's called Long Live the Queen, 23 Rules for Living. Very, very interesting book. Has some really funny stories in it. But Brian, from your book, it sounds like the Queen keeps a very active lifestyle and sticks pretty closely to her routines. While we all may not have access to the same resources she has, are there things she does that um, we might want to adapt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it was actually sort of a big concern I had going into this project of looking at the Queen's life. Um, I wasn't exactly sure 
what I was going to find or how applicable um, the Queen's lifestyle secrets were going to be. Um, major point, I didn't want to spend much money trying to act like the Queen or, or let alone buy a corgi or anything like that. So I, um, so to my great surprise and, and really tremendous relief, um, what eventually emerged in my research was um, this portrait of an incredibly unfussy, down-to-earth individual who, um, let's remember, actually said that she wanted to be a farmer's wife when when she was little and when she grew up, if, if she wasn't the queen. So she's never f felt the need to, let's say, uh, hire an expensive lifestyle coach or a fitness trainer. Instead, she has structured her life pretty phenomenally around these um, a unique set of mental strategies and philosophies and attitudes. And because it's mostly up in her mind, um, it's something that, um, of course, costs no money for the rest of us to follow and can make her, oddly enough, such an um, applicable role model, no matter really what social economic racket you're in today. You've got some really fun stories here. We'll try to get to some of them in just a little bit. So okay. thank you, Brian, Jane, and Diane. It's now time for us to take your questions out there. I'd like to welcome Jean Setzfan to our discussion to help facilitate your calls. Welcome, Jean. Thanks, Barbara. Delighted to be here. Well, we're so glad to have you there. And let's take a first question now for Jane, Diane, or Brian. Oh, who have you got? Um, the, our first call is coming from Matt in Maryland. and. I believe this call is going to Jane. Okay, I didn't hear the name, but uh, next caller. Jane, you ready? Caller, you're on hi, the Jane. air. Uh, yeah, hi Jane, I'm Matt from uh, Maryland. I'm a huge fan. Um, you've had the chance to play Queens and other people in the world family, and you've had a chance to meet them in real life too. I was just curious, what's the biggest difference between Hollywood portrayals and real life? Well, um, I must admit, watching The Crown, I'm incredibly impressed with um, how well that's been, been done. I think that really is a phenomenal show. Um, and I would agree, you know, the, the royal family are very down to earth. I mean, I've met the Queen on a number of occasions and Prince Philip, Princess Anne, Prince Charles. We used to play polo with him. Um, I've met Prince Andrew and Prince Edward. I knew Diana. I've never met Camilla. And I have met Harry. I've, ne I've never officially met um, um, uh, Prince William um, either. But And I met an, a lot of other royals, who, some of whom have been friends of ours, who've been at our house. And I would say that, you know, tradition is very important. Um, uh, some royals work harder than others. The Queen works by far the hardest in them all. And Princess Anne is probably the hardest working royal of all, and she's unbelievable. And, um, you know, they, they're, they're quite down to earth. I mean, Prince Charles loves to do watercolors, which I love, and play polo and, uh, and farm. And, um, but the, the queen is amazing. You know, when you meet her, it doesn't disappoint. She's tiny, and yet she just, she's so kind of quietly powerful. And, um, and she really makes you believe that you're the first time she's ever actually, you know, talked to somebody, I mean, which is astounding. It's something to be, to learn from, you know, when you meet a lot of people like I do, they, I mean, the queen's got it down and her little wave too. <laughs> <laughs> Great answer. And thank you, Matt, for that question. Now, for everyone watching and listening, please stick around because we'll be taking several more of your questions in just a bit. Before that, I have a few more questions myself for our guests. Jane, one area that you and the queen have in common, you're both dedicated to giving back. What drives your philanthropic work, and are there any lessons that you've drawn from the Queen? Well, I think that the Queen, as you said, is up to date. You know, she, she's wanting to be modern, she's, but she also respects tradition. She has an enormous amount of energy. Um, you never notice that she's ill or sick or can't show up for something. I mean, she, she puts on puts on the frock, puts on the hat, the gloves, and uh, has the, you know, does does the right thing. And uh, I think, you know, I've learned from that. I mean, in my profession, you know, everyone loses their job if I don't show up to work. So I feel an enormous responsibility to stay healthy and to um, have the kind of energy to be able to fulfill the task that I promised to perform. And yes, I have played a number of royals. It's very fascinating. I played uh, Marie Antoinette. I'm now currently playing uh, Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was Queen of England there for a while. 
and Queen of France, actually. Um, and it, I find it fascinating, the whole royal family. I mean, uh, our royal family, um, uh, the, the Windsors, who are actually German. Ah. which must have been very confusing during World War I and II. And you've never played Jane Seymour, third wife of, uh, of uh, King Henry VIII, no, right? I, <laughs> no, I, I, I stole her name when my, my agent told me I couldn't be Joyce Penelope Wilhelmina Frankfurt. <laughs> um, I, I like that name, too. Okay, so, yes, and, and Jane Seymour was the, the least known um, wife at that time, but uh, yeah. We're going to come back to you in just a minute. Let's go to Jean Setsfand again to find out who we have on the line waiting to ask questions. Jean? Uh, we have quite a few questions coming in from YouTube. And uh, let's go to Lita from YouTube who's asking, what is the routine of the queen from Monday to Friday? Does she have a Saturday and Sunday free schedule? How long does she vacation? Uh, I think that's appropriate for Brian. Okay, great. Brian, we've got a question from Vida. She'll uh, ask you right now. Did you hear the question? I did. Okay, yeah, then you. How, how would you answer that? Well, a lot of what people don't know is that technically the queen only gets two days off every year. And yeah, that's just one year. Um, so she and those days are Easter and Christmas. Every other day, um, day in and day out, these red boxes get delivered to the palace or wherever she is in the world, and they are bursting with parliamentary paperwork, which takes a good two to three hours uh, to complete every day. Um, so even when the queen is technically on holiday, let's say up in Balmoral or at Sandringham, she's still um, putting in a lot of hours every day working. Um, and I, I think people have a hard time realizing when the queen really rests, um, but she does. Um, that's why Balmoral is 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 a crucial time when she goes up there in the late summer. Um, those those few weeks that she's up there, um, I believe it's don't quote me on this, but I think it's six weeks that she's up there um, hibernating, as she likes to call it. She's still working, but um, she's a big introvert. So introverts, of course, love to rest in very low stimulating, um, private, solitude filled environments. And that's why she values her annual pilgrimage up to Balmoral so highly. Um, it gives her a chance to, um, to get that solitude that she craves of her up at Balmoral with her corgi dogs and uh, walking with her beautiful scarves. Uh, I guess the media is always around wherever she is. Is that right, Brian? They are. She gets, Balmoral is different. Um, Balmoral is her favorite place to hibernate because um, where Sandringham, her estate in Norfolk, um, public roads actually go through Sandringham. So even when she's taking a walk, um, she could potentially run into someone. That's not the case at Balmoral. Um, public roads actually go around a more than 50,000 acre estate there. Um, so the queen once spoke about her time at Balmoral and she, you could almost hear the relief in her voice when she said, you know, you could, you could walk for miles and not see anybody. And, you know, she just said that with glee because for, for a real introvert like she is um, and someone who doesn't get that privacy that she craves all the time, um, that is just paradise for her. But uh, the media, uh, they they are not following really her to bad moral. And especially um, prime ministers will, will go up there and she still continues to see her ministers. But um, she's she's pretty much left uh, in, 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 in important solitude up in Balmoral. I think a lot of people respect that. I want to remind people that if you're on the phone, please press star three to ask your question. And if you're watching online, you can place your question in the comments section. Let's go back to Jean Setsfan and see who we've got waiting to ask a question. Jean? Our next call is coming from Donna from Utah, and she has a question for both Jane as well as Brian. Oh, okay. Well, Donna from Utah. Jane, let's start with you. Donna has a question for you. Hi, Jane. I love your look. And I'd like to know how <laughs> you, you keep yourself so young from the time that, like, even 40 years ago, you looked the same. I just don't know well, how you um, do it. Uh, well, I, you know, I think uh, what we're talking about, about an attitude and about, uh, you know, having, um, you know, healthy habits. 
you know, I, I tend to walk. I like to be in nature. I like to stay healthy. I like to eat sensibly. I don't do anything in extreme. Um, um, and, uh, you know, I, my job demands that I, I stay healthy and well and fit. So, um, and since I'm still working, you know, it, it, it matters to me. I don't, I haven't given up basically. Well, I agree. You certainly do look fantastic. <laughs> uh, Diane, Thank I you. saw in an article that Queen Elizabeth II regularly video conferences with her great grandchildren. What does this say about the Queen? Are these formal chats, or as someone wanted to know, does she wear the crown when she's video chatting with the kids? Well, I think that what's wonderful about Queen Elizabeth is that she is a the quintessential grandmother to all her grandchildren. They all have very special and different relationships with her. And then she's got a really sweet relationship as a great grandmother. And with George and Charlotte and Louis, Kate Middleton has said frequently that she leaves little gifts for them when she comes to visit. And I think what's really interesting is that she didn't have a lot of time for her own children when she was made, when she first ascended the throne, she was in her 20s. So she really was committed to almost solely to duty. And I think like a lot of people late in life, it's almost like a redo. She's She has the time now and she has the inclination to spend more time with these children. So she's got a very sweet and loving relationship with them as any grandparent or great grandparent. She's very fortunate that she's able to see two generations, two younger generations of her family and be close to them. So I, I think it's very sweet. Well, and she seems to have plenty of energy every time we see her with the kids around her, she's she's involved. So um, Yes, she, she, she loves, I think she's going to be introducing the children as they get slightly older. I don't think any of them ride yet. I think George is still too little, but Charlotte has a great interest in dancing and the queen has always been very interested in the arts. But I think you can see that with um, her grandchildren, that she obviously, Zara Phillips, inherited the love of writing, her mother, Princess Anne, obviously. So she's very encouraging of all her children, grandchildren, and she's quite smitten with all her great-grandchildren. I can imagine. Uh, let's go back to Jean, because we've got people waiting to ask questions. Jean, who have you got? Our next question is coming from Elizabeth uh, from Pennsylvania. And let's go to Brian with this one. OK, Elizabeth. Brian? Hello. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Uh, you don't hear much about uh, Prince Philip. I would like to know what his role is. Um, in the beginning, this was a huge complaint for Prince Philip because he didn't have a defined role as the Queen's consort. One had really not been invented. Um, and so he, he made that famous line where he says, I feel like I'm just a bloody amoeba. And I think without that strong sense of purpose um, through, through those beginning years, um, it's, it's strange. He kind of sunk into a depression. He got jaundice, which is often a condition associated with, with being stressed out. Um, but as soon as he started um, taking on charities and projects that were really important to him, um, that's when that's when he kind of blossomed as the queen consort as the queen's consort um so um his main role is um he we were talking about the queen's charities work um he takes on about 700 recently i know i know he's um kind of gone into semi retirement now but um until fairly recently he was taking on about 700 uh, charitable organizations that he was a uh, patron of and um this was keeping him absolutely busy around the clock. I mean, he would he would wake up early cock crow in the morning um, and the queen would still be asleep. That's why they often slept in separate bedrooms. Um, he had to get such an early start during the day. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, that's been largely his role throughout life. And it's it's kept him very busy. Well, thank you, Brian, for that. And let's go back to Jane, because we've got a lot of people standing by to ask questions. Jane, who have you got now? Our next caller is Marilyn from Prince Fredericksburg, and I think this one will go to Diane. Okay, Marilyn, what's your question for Diana? Uh, well, um, I love the pictures of the Queen riding because um, I'm 73 and still riding and using it as a retort to my brother who thinks I, I'm too old to ride. So thank you very much, <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. But my question is, how many horses does she? I know she has. There, you see a lot of horses, but. How many does she actually ride? Well, she has her favorite. And I think what we've seen in recent months, particularly this year, when she was forced to leave Buckingham Palace, 
and go to Windsor. So she has, a, I've been told she has one particular horse that she prefers to ride now that is not as sort of vigorous, should you say, um, is when she was younger. So she has a whole stable. She also has a horse racing sort of stable where she works with, um, funny enough, the um, ancestors um, that live in Highclere Castle. Um, and I think you saw that in The Crown that her racing manager was um, Porchy and they are the, um, the family that lives in Highclere High Castle. So she's very active with racing. She still loves Royal Ascot. I think she missed that ter terribly this year, but she has one special horse that she rides at Windsor um, that is a little more subdued than she had in the past. All right, thank you so much. And remember to press star three if you wanna to talk to us by the phone. Let's uh, go back to Jean Setsfan. Jean, who have you got? Our next call is from Andy from New York. Um, I'd like to address this to um, Miss Jane Seymour. Okay, Jane, here's Andy. Miss Seymour, uh, since you know the royal family and you may hear things, I mean, the subject of this um, uh, talk is life lessons from the queen. Um, does she ever think of setting an example by retiring, as some other monarchs do, so that their children can inherit them, inherit the thrones? while they're still uh, active and vital. Does she ever, have you ever heard her even think about that? Or is that just not gonna happen? It's not, it's not part of the constitution. From what I, I gather, um, you have to wait until, um, until the king or the queen has passed and then you, you, you take on. Um, so no, I don't think I see the queen um, quitting. She, that she's, I think, pretty traditional in that respect. And um, and I think it must be very hard for Prince Charles because he's been waiting a very long time. And of course, you know, uh, the queen and the queen mother, her mother lived to, I don't know, a hundred and something. I mean, she was amazing, absolutely amazing. So I don't personally think the queen will step down unless she's really, really ill. I mean, but it, it'd be very unusual. Now, thank you for that call. Brian, we actually have a question for you that was sent in by Ted from Long Island. Let's listen. Hi there, I'm Ted from Long Island. And my question is about the Queen's equanimity. There is a 50 cent word for you. And it basically means her ability to deal with adversity under fire and to be able to deal with things, no matter how serious, whether it's COVID or security issues nationally or personal family problems, to deal with them with such a low key level of um, equanimity, uh, uh, such a, a low key sense of calm and control. How does she do that? You have an answer for that, Brian? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, one of her private secretaries made a very similar observation. And he said that um, the queen has this uncanny ability to actually um, calm down when there's trouble and when there's problems rather than get emotionally riled up about something. Um, and it is a pretty remarkable ability. I feel it, it, it stems from two major places um, in her life. One is that you have to remember the queen was raised in a very specific and unique historic period in Britain. Um, historians sometimes refer to it as the era of the stiff upper lip. Um, this was a time in England when most Britons kind of unanimously agreed that when it came to facing adversity and trouble, it was best to face that very calmly and very unemotionally. Um, this was very much influenced by ancient uh, Stoic philosophy, actually. And you see this um, in Winston Churchill's famous World War II slogan, which was, you know, never, we never weary, never flinch, never despair. I I'm paraphrasing that. But that line um, became so beloved of the late Queen Mother, and and that whole philosophy um, was was so embedded into Elizabeth, um, and uh, now as the as 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 the Queen, um, she's really one of the last remaining of the ancient Stoics. Um, um, and and the second point, if I may quickly make, is that um, the Queen is an excellent forecaster, and. What she does is routinely sits down with her staff um, and hashes out 
the what ifs of life. What if this happens? What if this happens? Um, what's the worst case scenario? And as you could probably assume, most stress in life, most of our just personal stress in life comes from perhaps us not dealing with those what ifs questions of life. But the queen tries to avoid that by being very proactive and coming up with detailed protocols and procedures for dealing with um, all of those eventualities. Um, this became really apparent, I think, um, hours after Princess Diana died in the late 1990s. Um, while newsrooms around the world were kind of wildly trying to speculate what was going to happen, um, the Queen wasn't. The Queen was um, kind of bunkered down in Balmoral. She knew exactly what was going to happen because there was already a, a procedure, a protocol um, in place. It was called Operation Overload overlord that had been in place for um, many months at that time. And so, um, and that was what happens if a, what happens if a uh, member of the royal family dies overseas? Um, and so all of that was figured out months in advance. Um, the event did happen and that enabled the queen to those few precious moments she had with her grandsons up in Balmoral. Um, and to cherish them through that trauma, she wouldn't have had that chance to be so calm during that that time um, if she had not been such an excellent forecaster. Well, we've credited the British with keep calm and carry on. Some exactly. people say that right. was Winston Churchill. Maybe it was the Queen. Thank you, Brian. We'll get back to you in a minute. And uh, we want to take more questions live now. Just a reminder to ask your question. Please remember to press star three if you're on the phone. And if you're watching us, you can place a comment on Facebook or YouTube or AARP.org. So, Jean, uh, what's our next question? Our next question is coming from Betty in Florida, and this one's for Jane. Okay, Betty, what's your question for Jane? Hi. Go ahead, Betty. Hi. Yes, my question was for Jane Seymour. Okay. I just wonder if she's still acting. I watched her uh, show Dr. Quinn late night, and I just, I think she's so beautiful. I just wonder if she's still acting. Yes, I am still acting. In fact, I have a movie coming out next week called War with Grandpa with uh, um, Robert De Niro and uh, Uma Thurman. And uh, it, it's a wonderful family film. And I'm in that. And then another one called Friendsgiving. And I leave this Saturday for Spain to continue playing Eleanor of Aquitaine in a 22 hour miniseries that's being shot in all the medieval castles and all the, the the real places in Spain and France, even during the pandemic, which is interesting. I can't believe I'm going there to do that. But yes, I am very much working. I was also doing the Kaminsky method, and I'll be coming back to do a bit more of that too. You're still a very busy actress, Jane. And uh, let, let's uh, now find out uh, who else is out there waiting to ask questions. Jane, we have a question waiting? Absolutely. Uh, we have Betty from California, and this one's going to Diane. Okay. Betty, what's your question? Yes. Hello, Diane. I would like to know if the Queen is going to come to the United States soon. Well, unfortunately, the Queen has put her travel plans on hold largely due to the pandemic, but she doesn't really do any international travel anymore, and I think that's why we've seen Prince William and Prince Charles, Kate, they have sort of taken the reins and done that. So it's unlikely, unfortunately, that she's coming to the States, but she's always rolled out the welcome at any time a U.S. president or anyone else comes to the U.K. So I think that's probably the best chance of, of having her connect with anyone here in, the, in uh, the States is to have them go there. All right. Thank you. And uh, still more people out there waiting to ask questions. Dean, what have you got next yeah. for us? We have a great question from Catherine uh, on YouTube, who um, I will throw this to the panel um, to see if any one of them have an answer okay. to this question, which is, um, didn't the Queen enjoy any particular comfort food during the COVID-19 lockdown? Anybody know that? Does she enjoy well, any I particular know, comfort I food? Know what she, I, I do know what she has um, for breakfast. She has a really interesting routine. I just did a story uh, not too long ago for Best Life Online, and it turns out that she's a great fan of Special K. And she has that every morning, and it is on the dining room table when she eats it in a Tupperware container, which I just can't really imagine the queen using Tupperware, but that's what she eats for breakfast every morning. And 
She also has fairly, as I've been told, fairly simple tastes. She doesn't like a lot of sauces. She doesn't like things that are heavy. She enjoys things that are fairly standard, and she doesn't allow anyone to have garlic. You can't have garlic if you're a royal. You can't have any kind of sort of offensive spice kind of kind of thing. And she still enjoys her cocktails. She loves a glass of champagne. She drinks uh, Dubonnet, a Dubonnet cocktail now and again. But um, she's a religious cereal eater in the morning, which I find quite charming. I understand that she enjoyed having a gin and tonic with her mother before she passed away. Gin and tonics were very popular with the Queen Mother. They, and also Camilla Parker, uh, Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, loves them as well. So um, I think that there's a lot of uh, spirits at um, different parties and dinners. But um, it was once said that the Queen had something like four cocktails a day, which turned out to be a myth, of course. I mean, I think that she's quite aware of her health. But um, all these sort of ceremonial things basically allow the Queen to take a sip or two of something. But she does enjoy a cocktail in the evening. Well, we have more questions out there now. Jean, who's, who's waiting? Uh, our next caller is Lena from Shreveport, and this one's going to Jane. Lena? Okay. What's your question for Jane? Hi. My question is for Jane, and may I say I have thanks for this opportunity. The queen is often seen in hats, and when is it not appropriate for her to wear a hat? Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, you would have thought, I would have thought she weren't supposed to wear a hat maybe in church, but she wears a hat in church. I, I don't know. I don't think I've ever, hardly ever see her without a hat. Um, of course, the head scarves and uh, no, I, I actually don't know. That'd be a good question. Ah, uh, well, okay, we know that uh, somebody will be talking to her pretty soon, and so if one of you does, please ask her, does she ever not wear a hat? I suspect when she's in, at home, she's brought, probably not in a hat. She really, she always wears hats when she's at any kind of an occasion, and they're made by um, Stuart Parvin, does a lot of work with her dresser, Angela Kelly, but she's, I don't think I can ever remember seeing her without a hat, or as Jane said, a headscarf. That's sort of part of her uniform. I think it makes her feel very comfortable. And I think what's also really interesting is that I have been told that her hats and her coats, as you obviously know, are so colorful. I mean, you could pick her out in a crowd and that is in fact the reason why she wears them because she feels that these large crowds come out to see her and she of course can't get to everyone, but she always makes sure that she's wearing a bright colored coat and hat so that people at least can see her from a distance. And also known for that purse always tucked in her elbow. Oh, always the purse. And I have a little funny story about the purse, too. The reason that the way that she communicates with her staff and tells them that she's finished talking to someone is she'll take the purse off one arm and switch it to the next. And that tells one of her aides to get her to sort of move along to the next person because perhaps she's been sort of caught up with a very talkative sort. So that's their sort of secret signal that they use to to have her um, let them know that she's done speaking with whoever she's speaking with. Brian, I think you had a comment of course, on that. Oh, good Brian? Oh, no, just one point. Uh, the only time she really doesn't wear uh, a head covering uh, or a hat, let's say, um, actually is the time that makes most people most upset is that is that when she's um, riding, when out uh, horseback riding, she's never really liked to wear any kind of protective headgear. Um, so that's... Interesting, because she's so she's so um, careful. Self, I, sorry, yeah, she's so, so careful, careful and so, I, so yeah. self-preservation. Um, that, but uh, but it's the same with with a seatbelt. It's very difficult to actually get the queen to wear a seatbelt for some reason. <laughs> wow. Mm. Well, Prince Philip got in trouble that time last year when he wasn't I, wearing a seatbelt either. So mm. <laughs> that's. A, I think it's the hairstyle. Don't you think it's the hairstyle? You can get squished with a with a helmet. Oh, that's true. And she has. Yeah. Yeah. she had the Good same point. hairstyle forever? That, yeah, that she she has. And somebody commented, I think, in one of the series that uh, there was one time where she changed her hair and Prince Philip didn't like it. Do you remember that in the scene oh, from right. the, it was crown? In the Crown? I, I think there was a scene in the Crown that I remember. Yeah. She had that. Would Claire Foy had that beautiful sort of long little flip that you see in that picture right right there. But then I think they had it in the series where after she became a mother, she wanted to make it sort of no fuss, so it was a little bit shorter and curlier. And he didn't care for it, and that's what they put in the show as well. And she just thought, well, it's quite sensible. And he said, no, I don't like it. 
But um, yeah, <laughs> I think that was sort of the shift from being before motherhood where she had more time. I mean, as if she does her own hair, which is absurd. She doesn't do her own hair, but she wanted something that was simpler that she could take care of more easily when she became a mom. Well, we right. have a reminder for folks out there to ask your question. Remember, be sure to press star three if you're on the phone. And if you're watching us, you can place a comment on Facebook or YouTube or AARP.org. Jean, you have another question for us? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, our next caller is Stephanie from Wisconsin. And let's start with Brian on this one. Okay. Stephanie, what's your question for Brian? Yes, I wondered that if the queen has any special hobbies or interests that she pursues, it doesn't sound like she has a lot of spare time, but when she does, is there anything that she enjoys doing? Um, I was also wondering about her tastes in in uh, leisure reading. Um, yeah, okay, so one of the lesser known facts about the queen, I think we see her often as such a hard, dedicated worker, but she is also one of those very rare individuals in the world who have managed to hold on to their childhood sense of play. Um, when the queen was growing up, she was, oddly enough, she, peer pressure was kind of absent from her upbringing. So she was never taught to, sort of like all of us were maybe in our teenage years, to separate um, or to view play as something that was something uncool or unproductive. So you see Elizabeth um, playing, playing throughout her life. And, um, and she plays with the same things that she, as an adult, that she played with as a child. She has this unbroken play history really in her life, and that is um, horses in some way. Um, so when she was young, it was toy horses or pretending to be a horse a, a lot of the times. And that naturally morphed as she got older into riding horses, um, visiting stables, getting interested in horse breeding, um, of course, um, watching horse races and entering horse races. Um, this is, uh, and she always takes time every day um, like Diane mentioned, um, even during the pandemic, uh, she wanted to uh, get out there and ride one of her fell ponies. Um, it's it's crucial for her to take time every day to to play. Um, and uh, I believe it's one of the one of the um, little known secrets of of how she's kept, especially her brain, so plastic and um, and and so youthful. She um, play especially as adults, it taps into a very youthful, neotonic, um, very plastic part of our brain. And if we're not engaging in, in that kind of behavior, even as adults, um, that part of our brain tends to atrophy. Um, so yeah, big, big tip. Um, try to remember, like the queen, what did you enjoy doing as, as a child? It's very likely, same thing as the queen, that you you will enjoy that as an adult, whether it's building or getting outside, um, reconnect with that, um, that playful side of your personality. It's, it will have humongous, enormous impact. Sounds like some good advice. Let's go back to Jean Setzfan. She's got folks standing by to ask more questions. Jean? Uh, we have another question coming in from YouTube, and this one's coming from Patty, and she's asking, how do they determine titles? Um, in particular, she's asking about the difference between a duke and a prince. Uh, maybe Jane, you can help us with that one. Jane, you want to answer that question for Patty? Me? <laughs> oh, well, I, I mean, to my knowledge, you know, princes and princesses, that's a direct line in, in the, the royal family. Um, but it is interesting. I think dukes, this is something you become, obviously, if you were married to the Queen, he became the Duke of Edinburgh. And um, I think I it's can talk uh, a little bit about how it says it's, you, you. You tell us how somebody else knows better than me. <laughs> versions of them, but I'm happy to talk. Uh, uh, yes. How about uh, Diane? Think you can answer that? Yeah. Well, I think with obviously, as Jane said, prince. You, it's sort of you're a blood prince or princess, or in, for instance, Kate's case, um, when William becomes this, when Charles becomes king, and William becomes second in line, he will then become the Prince of Wales. And then, and then Kate would actually get the same title that Princess Diana had. Um, and interestingly enough, Camilla has that title, but it was considered too controversial. So that's why she assumed the title of Duchess of Cornwall. 
The other thing um, about titles is that the queen can honor people with titles at will. So you see, it's always the, it was a very big secret and an exciting time when William and Kate were getting married. That very morning, it was announced that she had given them the title of Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. And then when Harry and Meghan got married, it was the same thing. Prince Harry got an additional title of Duke um, and she was the Duchess or is the Duchess of Sussex. So she bestows those type of titles at will. My understanding is that an Earl title is part of the British aristocracy. For instance, Diana's father was Charles Earl Spencer. And when he passed away, Charles Spencer, Diana's brother, assumed the title. So I think there are titles that are given, and then there are titles that you are just born into, and that would be the prince and princess, as Jane said. Well, great. My good, some answers there. Jane, I know you've got other folks waiting for some answers, too. Let's hear who you've got now. Our next caller is Louise from Florida, and let's go back to Brian for this one. Okay, Louise, what's your question? Yes, I'd like to know if Queen Elizabeth has a favorite pet that is always by her side, and she gives him little treats now and then, and he sleeps with her in her room. Uh, just a, a very close companion. You have an answer for that, Brian? Yeah. Um, Princess Diana made a really great observation once, and she said, you can almost hear and feel the, when the queen is coming because she's constantly uh, surrounded by this moving carpet of corgis. Um, so definitely 100% uh, Welsh corgis are her favorite pet. Um, she has many of them and she's had many of them throughout life. This is something that's started when she was a very little girl when she was given her first one. Um, and um, not to put the queen on the couch or anything like that, but um, a lot of people kind of assume that, um, you know, corgis are a very, very interesting breed. Um, they're kind of a uh, part cat, part dog in a way. They can be very feisty. They can be everything really that the queen is not, um, kind of ill-mannered, they'll, they'll snap at you. Um, so it kind of people assume that uh, the queen kind of buffers herself with all these corgis because they almost function like um, her alter ego in a way. They do things that she just <laughs> could never get away with. And she, there's, there's, she lives a little bit vicariously through through her pets. But it, yeah, she, 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 like I said before, um, in, in the beginning, she loves animals. She, she honestly, as a girl, um, she, she said she wanted to be a farmer's wife. That was her and have a lot of animals and have a lot of barnyard animals. Um, that was her dream growing up. Um, and of course, completely changed when her uncle abdicated. I, I'll never be able to look at a corgi again and not think of it as the queen's alter ego, Brian. Thank yeah. you for that. Jean, let's go back to you. Jean says, fan, who have you got for us now? Our next caller is Marvie from D.C., and we'll go to Jane with this one. Okay, Marvie, what's your question? Yes, well, you really just answered my question because I was wondering as to who picked out her clothes because she's just so elegant and everything matches so wonderfully. That's something that I, I feel like we are missing today, the elegance that we've always had down, down through the years. And she just shows such, you know, such elegance. So uh, you really kind of answered my question. Who does, the, the, the lady you mentioned, did she fix out her, her clothes, uh, her outfits? Uh, does somebody like want to answer that? Yes, please. That. Uh, yes. Diane, why don't you well, answer that? Sure. The queen has uh, a dresser who has been with her for a very, very long time. Her name is Angela Kelly. And she's so close to the queen that the queen actually gave her permission to have uh, a book written about their relationship. And it, it actually outlines how they pick out her clothes um, and also shows some beautiful things through the years. Because this woman started, Angela Kelly started out as a, a staff, a member of staff and gradually became more and more important in the queen's life. So the queen has a number of dressers that are supervised by Angela Kelly, but she does have her outfits picked out every day. Angela sometimes designs them, as I said earlier, with Stuart Parvin. Other times she just will help sort of navigate what she will wear of her existing clothes. But um, she's very meticulous and a lot of thought goes into the particular color that she wears for a particular occasion. Um, there's always a lot of coordination, as, as I mentioned earlier. But Angela Kelly is really the woman who has been at her side for decades. And she not only dresses her, but the queen considers her a very trusted advisor. I think Brian wants to uh, chime in on that, the queen's wardrobe. Brian? Yeah, um, 
I think even as a princess, um, Elizabeth was never like a frou-frou-y princess. She was, as her governess said, she was never really cared a fig for clothes. What she is more interested in is the symbolic visuals that, that her wardrobe can, can tell people. So she actually sends a lot of different clues of, of the outfits that, within the outfits that she wears. Um, and what she puts on every day is sort of functions like an act of service um, to, to people. And um, it's incredibly interesting. Um, I think maybe Diane mentioned it, but when, when she goes and uh, visits a foreign country, um, her dresser and her will, will sit down and figure out um, what are the patriotic cues of that country? What are the positive colors? Um, and her, her outfit will definitely reflect that. Um, it is it's an act of service, what she wears. Um, that's why she never wears anything too flamboyant. She doesn't want to inspire envy in others, but like Diane said, um, she wants to make sure that she wears something bright so she'll stick out in a crowd. She she never, like she says, can ever wear beige because she would just blend in and no one would know where, who she is. Um, but, um, and and another, another aspect I think of her wardrobe is that, um, another symbolic aspect is that she's always wanted to portray um, the the permanence and the continuity of the monarch through what she's wearing. That's why, um, though her wardrobe has uh, updated itself through the years, it, it looks relatively the same. Even uh, like we were saying, her hairdo hasn't changed. This is all very purposeful. It's to convey that uh, the semblance of this is a stable position. I am a stable person. I am a stable queen. I do not. Um, I do not fall for the latest fashions. And you can always depend on me. I will be there. Um, so all of that is purposeful, and I love the fact that it's, it's all of these are uh, subtly hidden in what she wears every day. Okay, Brian. Let's uh, find out who else is uh, out there waiting. Jean, another question. Our next caller is Betty from Ohio, and let's start with Jane with this call. Okay, Betty. What's your question for Jane? One of the things I wanted. Wondered how in the world she ever keeps her figure as she does. She must be very strict about what she eats, but she has always been so beautiful and gracious. <laughs> Jane, you have any uh, idea how she keeps her figure as it is? The queen. Yes. The queen. We could probably ask um, you that question too. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I think, think? Uh, I think we we heard to some degree um, that she she has opposite tastes of mine. I believe that the queen was raised with a lot of nursery food. And I think that's why she likes, you know, very kind of bland nursery food. I was, however, raised with very spicy Indonesian food as my mother was from Holland and uh, we're a whole family of foodies. So I, I love fresh food and I'm a bit of a farmer myself. I've got an organic garden. I love fresh vegetables and I, and fish and I, I try to eat healthily, but, uh, you know, I don't overindulge in anything and I don't believe the queen does either. Um, and, uh, you know, from what I gather, you know, she has quite simple tastes. And, and so would you Brian. if you had to go to all those rubber chicken dinners. <laughs> exactly. Brian, you had a few uh, um, tidbits in your book about uh, how she keeps herself so thin. She learned as a young child uh, not to eat all the sugar cubes that her father would allow them to have after dinner. Is that right? You said she'd line them up and just take her time eating them. Crystal yeah. sugar cubes. She has always demonstrated phenomenal willpower. And she's almost liked to um, see how far her self-control should could last. So when she was a little girl, her father um, had this little ritual after lunch where he would hand Princess Margaret and Elizabeth uh, a little handful of sugar to, as, as a little treat. Um, uh, he gave one to Princess Margaret. Margaret, being Princess Margaret, popped the whole thing in her mouth and just started sucking away. Um, you know, no surprise there. But um, when it came to Elizabeth, she got her sugar and she would carefully arrange each one in order of size. And then only would then she allow herself to um, eat each one individually and, and savor each one. So and you see this willpower um behavior in this queen um, to this very day. Um, there, there is an interesting, I think, secret behind it, but we could get to that if, if you wanted to later. Yeah, save it for later. I wish I could yeah. do that with chocolates. Let's uh, ask Jean again uh, to take uh, some questions from out there. Who's out there waiting? Sure. We have a call from Joanne from Texas. Let's go to Diane with this one. Okay, Joanne, what's your question? Oh, I lived in England from 1963 to 66, and at that time, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, 
drove herself uh, to different places, including to uh, some of Prince Philip's polo matches. Uh, I wondered if she still drives. She actually does, which I find quite extraordinary. She loves to drive the Range Rover around. Uh, right now, she is not in, in Buckingham Palace. She doesn't drive in London, certainly, but she loves to drive in the country. And what's interesting is that she is the only person um, in the UK that doesn't need a driver's license. So she can do as she pleases, but she tends to just stay on the property. But um, she's been driving. She, she recently was seen uh, driving with one of uh, with Prince Andrew, who had come to visit his parents because they were um, sheltering together during the pandemic. But um, she likes to get out and, and drive. And um, so far, there hasn't been any incidents. Prince Philip last year had to give up driving because he had that minor accident um, at Windsor. But um, she, as far as we know, she's still behind the wheel and wears her seatbelt. You can, with the pictures that you do see her um, when she's driving, she does wear her seatbelt. Does she have to have a driver's license in England? No, <laughs> I'm told not. that she, she doesn't. I mean, who's going to tell not the queen she can't drive? She, she can do what she wants. <laughs> of course, she's the queen. Well, Jane, Diane, and Brian, before we end, do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners out there? Jane, let's start with you. And then we'll go to Diane and then Brian. Um, well, I had the privilege of um, befriending the man who's the keeper of the queen's privy purse. You might wonder what that means. And uh, she's very fond of him and he does spend time with her and is invited up there to Balmoral. So I've heard from him, you know, exactly as you're saying, that she loves to be there. She's very happy and very very normal and she likes a normal kind of life. And and um, I was given the privilege of going into Buckingham Palace and seeing behind the scenes a little bit of what life is like there. And it's really, you know, it's a huge building with a lot of formal places, but there's also where she lives and where the office is and this, that and the other. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm in awe of her. I, I think the Queen is amazing. I think she it does wonders for um, keeping people all over the world, and especially in England, feeling like you know we can keep calm and carry on. So um, I salute her. I agree with you. Anybody else now? Diane? I think what's extraordinary about the Queen, particularly at this point in time in our history, is that she represents so much to so many people. People in the UK, obviously, see her as a, a not only as a beacon of sort of hope an aspirational figure someone that you can look up to because of the fact that she has endured so many things when you think about the world leaders that she's met winston churchill was her first prime minister i mean when you think of all the prime ministers that the uk has had from winston churchill to boris johnson she has sat with each one of those people every week and, or talk to them over the phone, in this case, during the pandemic. But she represents a permanence in a world that is just obviously in chaos right now. And I think that people look to her. That's why I thought it was really interesting that she gave that speech um, during the pandemic and sort of encouraged people to, as Jane said, keep calm and carry on. And then she also had a message for the NHS workers that gave so much of themselves during um, the virus outbreak as well. So I think it'll be, it will be a cultural shock to the world, but particularly to obviously the people in England, when she's no longer queen. I think she represents uh, something that is just vanishing in this world, which is stability and the idea that someone is duty bound and respects tradition and all of that. I think that's what she'll be, she'll be remembered for, not only because of her leadership, but because of the fact that she has been such a, an, an anchor in people's lives, not only people that she knows, but everyone in the world looks to her in that way. Of course. Uh, yeah, just real quick, if anyone wants to start acting a little bit more like the queen, just start embracing her internal optimism. One of her favorite all-time lines is from the mystic, um, medieval mystic poet, uh, Julian of Norwich, which goes, all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. So if you can remember that, you're really on your way to living a, a royally blessed life. All shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Well, that's a great way for us to end this. This has been so much fun and very informative. I've learned a lot today. Thank you all for being with us. Thanks to each of our guests for answering all of the questions that we posed of you.
And thank you to the AARP members, volunteers, and listeners for participating in this discussion. All of the resources referenced, including a recording of today's Q&A event, can be found at aarp.org slash ATM Presents on October 2nd. That's tomorrow. Again, that web address is aarp.org slash ATM Presents. We hope that you've enjoyed today's event and learned something from Queen Elizabeth that you can use in your own life. I'm Barbara Harrison. Thank you again for being with us, and this concludes our live event.